Hey everyone, you're listening to the Simple Electronics Podcast. I'm your host, Dan, from the Simple Electronics YouTube channel. And with me today is, well, absolutely nobody special because I'm all on my own. This episode is brought to you by PCBWay, but more about that later on. Once again, two weeks seem to have flown right by, and um, I have been very busy. I have not worked so much as a mechanic for the last uh, two weeks. I have done uh, a few shifts, but mostly I've been busy uh, live streaming on my second channel. And live streaming is a fantastic way for me to force myself to be busy. You see, usually I would come down in the morning, have a coffee, watch some YouTube, and then all of a sudden it's lunchtime. But what I've been doing is I've been scheduling these streams for 8 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, big sorry for those of you in Australia or Europe. It's a little bit weird times for you. But every day when I have a scheduled stream, I come right down here, get the streaming computer going, uh, hit play, and I do something interesting. Um, usually it's working on stuff for the channel, but sometimes it can be a little bit more fun. For example, um, it came to my attention that I had to figure out sort of um, what kind of thrust was created by um, a brushless motor that I have for a project that I'll talk about a little bit later in this podcast. And on my little workbench, there's not a lot of space to swing a 10 inch that is, well, like 250 millimeters or so. I don't have anything to compare to. Actually, I do. Hang on one second. Uh, 10 inches is roughly, hey, 255 uh, millimeters. So a 10 inch propeller. And it was supposed to give an approximate thrust of two kilograms, but 2.2 kilograms or so. And so I told the live stream viewers that if I can uh, design a base for this uh, propeller and send it to the 3D printer and print it out for the next morning stream or for the next stream, whatever it was, I was going to do that regardless of how sketchy it was to swing this propeller around. And so I did design it in CAD in front of them. I did print it out. And the next day, sure enough, we swung the propeller. That made for a hilarious little bit of video, which I might edit into a short or something. I don't know. It's kind of weird to have it like stuck in a giant, you know, three and a half or four hour live stream. Um, but that's that's probably that's for another day. Um, but yeah, I swung this propeller, 10 inch propeller. It created a vortex of stuff. It pushed a whole bunch of stuff off my bench and it was really scary because there wasn't much to hold it down to my bench. So the thing wanted to kind of take off and fly away. I put a huge heavy weight on, on the board that it was uh, attached to, and it was lifting the weight. So uh, this is going to be a little bit nuts uh, for this project that I'm putting it in. But you'll have to stick around. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the podcast. It was really fun to read the reactions of the people who were watching live. And uh, some of the viewers uh, said they would go back and uh, rewatch it again after the stream. So that was a lot of fun. Um, I also got done a lot of sort of productive things. So, for example, the trailer tester PCB is now complete. I completed it uh, live on stream. So people were watching me actually build this thing in real time and then send it out to PCB way and uh, I got it in my hands now. The only problem is um, I selected the wrong footprint uh, in the uh, sort of the, how it works is there is a incoming breaker. So there's 12 volts coming in. There's a breaker. Then there's a relay, which is activated by a relay driving circuit. And that relay driving circuit has a uh, 2N2904, I think the uh, a PNP transistor anyways, and I selected that from the KiCad library, which was all fine and good, but I wanted to use a surface mount version to have more space. When I selected the footprint for the surface mount version, I didn't pay close enough attention to the pin assignments, and so the pin assignments are wrong. And so there, on another live stream, I went and assembled the thing, it didn't work, and so the viewers watched me diagnose this live, um, you know, as I was going through the process of, you know, figuring out that 
I guess I can't make a video on this board just yet. So these are the kinds of things which are super fun to sort of go through the motions with the viewers. Like um, a lot of the people who show up to the live stream are like sort of like the hardcore fans and they they sort of get to see the behind the scenes without having to pay, you know, for like a Patreon subscription or stuff like that. I really like that direct um, involvement as well. So that was pretty cool. But yeah, that PCB way, uh, PCB was quite frustrating. The fact that um, I got that wrong. I can't believe I have pinned it improperly. And so maybe uh, on tomorrow's stream, I'm recording this on the 30th. So on Wednesday morning, um, basically, you'd have to be a Patreon member to hear this on Wednesday. But on the Wednesday morning live stream, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to see if I can just clock, like turn the transistor on the pad a little bit and see if that'll work. But I have a feeling it'll have to be upside down. So I, I don't know if that's going to be useful. You see, when I order these boards, um, it takes a week and a half or so to get them here, which is not too bad. But a week and a half of lost productivity for making that video is kind of a pain in the butt. I usually go back and fix these designs before I release it to the public anyway. So usually um, what you see on video will be revision one of a project and what you get to download and uh, use from PCBWay, for example, will be revision two of mine or sometimes three or four, whatever it may be. So usually I just make do with the boards I have, even though the boards aren't particularly expensive, right? With shipping, um, I get the exp the express shipping. It's only like 22, 25 bucks, something like that American for 10 boards. And um, so it's not that big of a deal to for me to just fix it in um, KiCad and then get another set ordered. But it just, it takes the wind out of my sails when I, when I keep messing up boards like that. And and I know it's a completely normal process. Lots of people mess up their PCBs. There are lots of jokes uh, referring to the fact that if you don't if you don't have a genuine bodge wire on your PCB, then you're not actually making PCBs and so on and so forth. But it, it's just frustrating that uh, it seems like everything goes perfectly and then everything stops going perfectly. So yeah, so that that's kind of what you get when you come to the live stream. You get a little bit of chaos, you know, spinning up a propeller. And you also get a little bit of the realness it is to make YouTube videos sort of on a deadline. So tomorrow I'm going to try to salvage it. If I uh, salvage it, which I'm hoping I can. I haven't looked yet. I don't want to be uh, sort of depressed. <laughs> so I'm going to look at it live on uh, stream. But if I do salvage it, then the turnaround for making a video is only a couple of days, right? I'm going to probably record the video tomorrow if that, you know, if, if that's the, uh, if that's the, if it works, I'll record the video tomorrow and then I'll edit it in the next couple of days and then it should be ready to go live to uh, my Patreon audience for a couple of days and then go live to the YouTube at large. But it's really cool that the people on the live stream, they get to see the product before it's done, like before it's recorded, as it's being recorded, and then they get the final product as well. So it's pretty cool. I also feel like a lot of the people who come into the into the live stream, they're at work. And so while I'm working, they're working. We're all working together, which is um, pretty interesting. It makes me feel a little bit less alone here in my basement workshop. So that's been a lot of fun. And a new addition to that workshop is a new 3D printer. Um, on my live stream, I was printing, and you guys have probably heard me say it to death, do not buy the 3D printers that I own. Most of them are absolute, actually, they're all absolute trash up until now. So I reached out to a couple of um, 3D printer makers, companies, because my... Uh, Chinese Shinwini that I've been using uh, recently for 3D printing because the bed is so much bigger than my X3A, the extruder started clicking. And so live on stream, I pulled it off the um, stepper motor and I opened it up 
and I saw that one of the bearings had completely destroyed itself, which had worn out the shaft for one of the dual gears. This is like a BMG clone. And those gears started skipping and eating into the aluminum and doing all sorts of stuff. The, the Basically, the extruder is completely toast. Thankfully, I had parts on hand, so I rebuilt it and put it back together, and it is now working. But I am just a little bit tired of 3D printing with garbage 3D printers. So I put out the call. I messaged quite a few makers, and I'm not going to put them on blast. My channel, don't forget, is kind of small and kind of concentrated. So those of you listening to the podcast are probably thinking, no, no, it's a good channel. I like this stuff. But it doesn't have very much broad appeal. So I did get an answer from only one of the manufacturers, and that was Elegoo. And they sent me their Neptune 4 Max. This is the, well... To say that it's the biggest 3D printer that they offer is an understatement. This thing is absolutely ginormous. The whole packaging weight was 50 pounds. The box, I had measured it. I think it was like 37 inches by 27 inches by 11 inches. Absolutely huge. A challenge to get it all in one frame for the live stream. And I unboxed it live on my uh, live stream channel. And the bed is uh, 420 millimeters, nice, by 420 millimeters, nice, by 480 millimeters tall. It says that it can do 500 millimeters per second of uh, movement. I think it's 500 millimeters per second. I think that's what, what they say. It's 500 something per second. I'm, I'm assuming it's millimeters. And um, of course, that's a little bit of marketing BS because that is uh, move speeds. You don't want to be printing, you don't want to be dropping filament at 500 millimeters per second, um, but the moves can be done. Um, but the crazy thing is, the bed being so big, I think the actual measured size of the bed is 430 by 430. It's a bed slinger. So that means the x axis is on a gantry, and then the y axis is the bed moving forward and back. So you need like two and a half feet of depth to your workbench to have this thing set up. It is absolutely giant. So I unbox this thing, load up their filament. They also sent me a kilogram of their uh, PLA in gray. And on the SD card or on the internal memory, I guess it works a little bit different, um, is a speed benchy. So the, 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 the benchy boat but in a, I think it's a 20 minute print. So I said, yeah, let's do it. And uh, I had installed a second camera for the, uh, for the unboxing of this thing. So we watched it do a 20 minute Benchy. And the Benchy came out like not quite Benchy shaped, obviously. When you go that fast, um, you do leave some quality to be desired. But it did print in like, I think it was 22 minutes, something like that, including the heat up time. So that was quite impressive. Uh, this machine runs Clipper. And Clipper, if you remember talking to, I think it was Greg, he was uh, explaining what Clipper is. But it's basically a hybrid piece of software. So some software gets installed in the microcontroller on the machine. Some of them on a sort of like a Linux type uh, microcontroller, a, a system on a chip. And you can access the printer and its workings from a browser. So from my web browser, I can just go to the IP address of this uh, printer and monitor it. I can send prints directly to it, right directly on that interface. Um, or I can use the touch screen. Like, this is a pretty cool machine. And I'm really happy to have it part of my arsenal. I'm, I'm actually quite excited about the, the, uh, the, the things that it opens up for me. And um, uh, so I've been playing with that for a little bit. And I'll tell you, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. 3D printing is still, sadly, very much a tinkerer's game because I've had had trouble getting stuff to stick without a brim, which is interesting because this is a textured PEI sheet that it comes with. So it should actually stick quite well. Um, but like PETG is having a little bit of issues sticking. 
Uh, some PLA, like smaller bases, is having some issues. I feel like I may not need to introduce a little bit more Z hop, where the where the print head sort of like moves away from the print while making its moves because it seems to be like tapping the edge of some of these parts and uh, knocking them off the bed. I mean, it's been a little bit frustrating because I just sent it with some big parts and um, I guess I wasn't paying enough attention to the bed adhesion and it just didn't really stick that well. But overall, it's been very positive. It's just that a couple of the big prints um, didn't quite make it. And I do have a big print coming up that we're going to talk about a little bit later on in the uh, pod, actually very soon in the podcast. Uh, so we're, you know, I'm going to tell you about my reservations about that. But but basically, it's been a lot of fun tinkering with this thing. There should be like a first look type video uh, coming out uh, fairly shortly. I got to make it fairly shortly uh, on the main YouTube channel. And then over time, maybe six months from now, there's going to be a sort of like full, you know, review type video. Um, but it's going to be hard because I'm going to have to put it in perspective because I am used to printing with crap 3D printers and this is not a crap 3D printer. So, yeah, there's that. Also, like I found the clipper interface, like the web interface uh, is sometimes like you send a command and it takes a little bit of time for it to figure out what you meant. So, I mean, there there are some growing pains. I, I'm in contact with Elugu and we'll see like what we can we can make out of that. But yeah, it's. Overall, it's a really good printer, and the price is right. I think it was $430 US with coupon on their website. Um, so under $500 for, like, literally. This thing, I, I can't even put into words. This thing is giant. My my chat couldn't believe how big it was, so I had to go get a banana upstairs and put it on the bed to show them what it, what it's all about. So, yeah, really cool printer. Still, though... I still lust after a Voron. I still, I keep seeing people on YouTube using Vorons and I really, really want to build one. So this year I'm, I'm probably going to, you know, I, you've been hearing it for a while, but this year I'm probably still going to buy a Voron. However, with this 3D printer, the Elegoo Neptune 4 Max, if it is reliable, if it gives me reliable prints, I get it all tuned in, dialed in, I do have a cool plan, and this is the first you guys will hear about it is right here on this podcast. So some of you might know that I have a pool, much to my chagrin. Uh, it's one of these things where you got to keep throwing money into it because if it doesn't run, you're damaging the components, and if it does run, then you're wearing out the components. So it's, anyways, owning a pool is one of the dumbest things, but, you know, we bought a house not that happened to have a pool, not the other way around. So anyways, we have a little uh, shed that the pool pump and the filter and stuff sits in. And in the summer, when it's like 20, 25 degrees outside Celsius, inside the, the pump house, it gets like 40 degrees Celsius. And when it's like 30 degrees outside, it gets like 50 degrees Celsius in that pump shed. And one of the ways to print ABS plastic on a open frame 3D printer like the Elegoo Neptune 4 Max is to put it in a heated environment. So you see where I'm going with this? I'm hoping that in the summer, especially in the spring where we have to run the pool pump 24-7 for a couple days to uh, really get all the all the bad stuff out of the pool and it starts heating up in that room and I have Wi-Fi connectivity to the Elegoo I'm thinking I'm just going to put a table in that shed. I'm going to have to clean it up a little bit, but I'll put a table in that shed and then I'll make like videos seeing if I can print ABS on an open frame printer by just putting it in the pool house. And the reason why I can't do that with my other printers uh, is that my most reliable one, the X5A, is full of PLA 3D printed parts. Those parts will get soft and they will not survive in that environment. But the Elegoo Neptune is all made out of steel extrusion and uh, non-PLA injection molded parts. So I should be able to print ABS in the pump house 
especially in the times where I have to run the pump 24 seven. And so maybe that Voron just reduced in price if I can print my own parts for it, because you have to print them out of ABS. So stick around and uh, find out, hopefully. Another thing you should stick around and find out about is the inexpensive Fluke Roundup, because I do believe the final part of the equation just arrived. So I think on the last podcast, I told you guys that I reached out to Probe Masters and asked them if they could ship me their uh, a set of their probes not using courier. So, you know, I would still pay them for the probes, pay them for the shipping, but US, use U.S. Postal Service. They said no because um, a lot of them go missing and it takes way too long to, for it to ship. And I said, look, I'll accept the risks because basically the price of the probes and the shipping is cheaper than the ju- than, than just the shipping from a courier like DHL. So they said yes, and guess what? They arrived perfectly. They're in my hands. So now I've got the probes I need, which means that I am ready to start testing. Now, the testing is going to be a kind of a long convoluted process because every one of the multimeters, that's the Fluke 101, the 15B+, plus, the 17B+, plus, the 18B+, plus, and the Kai Wheats uh, multimeter for comparison, will all be tested using their own stock probes, uh, a set of upgraded Fluke probes from a higher-end Fluke uh, sent, to, sent by a subscriber, and uh, the set of the Probe Master probes. That is four, uh, three sets of probes over five multimeters, and it's going to be a lot of testing because there are, I believe, there are four voltage ranges to test, uh, six resistors to, to test each with each probe, and there are uh, two capacitors to test, and um, we might put, I don't know, I haven't decided yet, maybe I'll put a sine wave up on a function gen and check the AC uh, voltage results and stuff like that. So, oh, plus the continuity buzzer and and all these kinds of things that I need to test, as well as dimensions and weight. And so I need to take all this data in, and then I then need to present it in an easy-to-present, easy-to-digest way, right? So that is going to be a long process. It's probably going to take a whole four-hour stream, maybe two of them, and that is one of the things that I really would like some feedback from you guys from. What kind of stuff do I need to be testing? Absolutely. So at the moment, I'm definitely testing, you know, voltage. I think my volt tester goes down to 2.5 volts and up to 12 volts or something like that. And I'm testing the resistances. Basically, I'm putting it through the Kiwitz meter gauntlet, all of them. But then, like, what else is important? Like, is weight important to you? Is uh, the angle of the tilting bale important to you? Is the size of the um, is the size of the display important to you? Is the hand feel important to you? Are the accessories important? Um, oh, I also have to go through a feature list, uh, you know. And these these things are kind of difficult to show in sort of like a video format, right, quickly. So I'm going to have to make graphs and stuff. So this is all sort of new territory for me. But I think it's these kinds of videos that may not get the most amount of views. You know, sort of like a Project Farm style video, but I don't have a Project Farm audience that'll get the most amount of, uh, that won't get the most amount of views, but that will sort of, um, you know, increase the importance of my channel. I, I kind of want to have some videos there for important reference, as well as I want to make um, articles on my website that have impact, that are real, that are uh, that are valuable, right? Not, not to advertisers particularly, because my website, I have vowed to continue to make advertiser fr- a free zone, no advertisers on my website. But I do want simple, the Simple Electronics YouTube channel to be a source of information. So that is going to be a huge undertaking, and I really hope that I'm able to execute it. I'm hoping to 
sort of like look at the way that the computer gaming industry YouTubers do it. Uh, you know, Gamers Nexus, uh, Linus Tech Tips. Uh, we're talking about Jay's Two Cents, creators like that. They have to present a whole ton of information in a way that's digestible. It doesn't make for the most views, but it does make for the most sort of practical importance. And that is something that's really important to me that I do need some videos to have practical importance. And I do know that that making this kind of content will feed kind of like the trolls, right? Some people are going to come in and they're going to say, well, uh, this is only for fluke fanboys, for example. And some of them will say, these are cheap Chinese crap. And some of them will say that you should just buy X or Y or Z. Or if you don't spend $800 on your multimeter, you're a fool. Or if you spend more than $20 on the multimeter, you're a fool. There's kind of all sorts of people that are going to come in here, but still, I find this kind of work to be really important. This is the kind of legacy I want to leave behind, you know, eventually, God forbid. So yeah, any input on this type of video making, you let me know what you want to see, and it, I will take it into consideration. But yeah, it's 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 not, I'm not taking it lightly, the fact that it's a very important video to make. So Here's hoping that the result will be worth the amount of effort I put into it. All right, all right. It's time to talk about that project, about the propeller and what the 3D printer is going to be doing for me. It's time to finally say it. But after the word from today's sponsor, PCBWay. So obviously, you guys know that I'm a big fan of PCBWay. They've been supporting the channel for a very long time. We have a really good partnership. And basically, if you're any kind of maker, PCBWay probably has the services that you need in order to finish your projects. So PCBs are the obvious thing. You get uh, 5 to 10 PCBs for $5 plus shipping and handling, up to uh, 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. Uh, however, they also have very affordable, I should say, uh, 3D printing. That is both uh, FDM and... Um, resin and SLS, like the powder um, 3D printing, as well as 3D printing in metal. They also have um, CNC, they do sheet metal bending, they do all sorts of stuff. So check out the link in the description below if you want to just figure it out for yourself or if you want to support the channel. All right, so the snow speeder is on revision two now. I have just finished the design of the new body. It's getting a full redesign. It's going to be like a closed cockpit type design. And it's going to be scaled up. So the old one used a fairly inexpensive hobby brushless outrunner motor uh, swinging a six inch three bladed prop. I think it's six inch by three, the pitch. And the problem with that is it's not quite powerful enough. Uh, oh yeah, it runs a three cell lithium polymer battery, which means roughly 12 volts. It's 11.1 .1 volts nominal, but uh, 12 volts fully charged. That was just not enough power. So uh, over the course of the last year or so, I've been uh, sort of doing some research. I bought a much bigger motor. The motor is physically about twice the size of the one that's in there right now. And with a uh, 10 inch by five inch propeller, it should have a maximum thrust of about 2,100 grams, 2,200 grams, so 2.1, 2.2 kilos. I do not have any uh, 10.5, that 10 by five inch props. So I have ordered some carbon fiber uh, 10 by four and a half inch propellers. But that means a 10-inch cowling has to be way bigger than the one that's on there at the moment. And so I redesigned the cowling, and I figured if I'm redesigning the cowling, I'm going to redesign most of the body of this thing. So now the cowling, the big fan section, is going to be integrated into the body. The body is going to be made like, well, it's a, like a, a hollow cockpit with uh, two supports down the middle. And... Um, I'm probably not going to redesign the suspension and the skis just because it seems as though the weather has become mild and is kind of staying. 
sort of mild. So I don't know how much snow we're going to have here for much longer. So I need to get this thing printing. And so I had just put it into the slicer for the Elegoo. Uh, and of course, the build volume on the Elegoo is ginormous. Like it's absolutely huge. But, you know, this thing fits on the bed, uh, on the uh, on the plate, on the build plate. But it's not as roomy as you might think. So this, what I'm trying to get at is the snow speeder is going to be giant. It is um, the old snow speeder, the version one, had as a goal that anybody can print them, print it if they really wanted to. This one here, you're going to have to cut the model into pieces or, um, you know, print it on a big bed or, you know, borrow a printer or something. Because this one is uh, th this one is more like, you know, for me. So I'm printing. I'm going to print this thing. It's going to take, uh, the estimate is two days and eight hours and some. And it's going to take about 1,200 grams of filament. That is a spool and 20% uh, of another spool. So uh, it's going to be a great sort of like crossover to test the Elegoo Neptune 4 Max. And at the same time to see how Elegoo, you know, handles their filament runout detection, um, the print recovery from, you know, a print not having enough filament. It's going to be all sorts of cool tests put in one. And at the end, I will have a brand new snow speeder. Now, don't fear if you're getting a little afraid that I might not be finished in time for um, snow. Because I can always design wheels for this thing. I mean, I have designed wheels for a separate project. So I can slap wheels on it. And we can have some fun on the pavement as well. I just think it was born as a snow speeder. And it needs to be reborn as a snow speeder. Um, this thing should give me a lot more space to run four cell batteries. And probably up to eight cell batteries if I really want to. I'm just limited by the 10-inch cowling section. But in principle, I could buy a much bigger motor and slap the much bigger motor in and use a 10 inch by three blade or a 10 inch by four blade uh, propeller. So, I mean, sort of, it's kind of endless, the uh, possibilities on this. And I also decided to make, you know, the, the Snow Speeder V1 was sort of built on a whim. It was sort of like, uh, you know, it, it was just put together the way I envisioned it with whatever filament I had here. So it turned out to be all different colors and stuff. But the new one is going to be printed in uh, red. So it'll be nice and vibrant. It should look really good on camera. It's going to be multiple pieces. I'm using heat set inserts for the very first time. And I, do, I did also add some things that the old snow speeder didn't have, which is hard points where I can mount cameras. It was very difficult for me to mount a GoPro on the old snow speeder. I had to strap it to the battery, basically. But this one here has uh, hard, hard mounting spots on the cowl, uh, left, right, and top. So I should be able to attach accessories to it, whether that be cameras, an FPV camera, uh, GPS, uh, whatever I need, basically, I should be able to have available so I can make much better videos. You know, the first one was kind of like me going off and designing what what I had in my in my head, what I wanted to see, but I didn't have a lot of emphasis on how I was going to present this project to the world. But this one here has those things built in. There's a nice flat section in the front that I can put the GoPro on with a sticky mount, and I've got those hard points. Um, so everything should go pretty well knock on wood. Um, nothing is guaranteed, obviously. But uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. I'm not going to redesign the side suspension. Might have to redesign the steering a little bit and move the servo to a different spot or something like that. But I'll, I'll have to deal with that when the time comes. For the moment, let's see if the Elegoo Neptune 4 Max can actually print a giant 3D print. Uh, I think this thing is like 350 or 360 millimeters tall. The uh, fan section, the body section together make it absolutely huge. I put a brim 
on it. So hopefully I have enough surface area touching the bed so it doesn't peel off. I put a, a big brim, like a 10 millimeter brim. We'll, we'll see if it all holds together, but uh, this thing looks absolutely insane. It should be a lot of fun. And honestly, it looks a little bit like a hovercraft. Like it looks like even if it doesn't have skis, it might, you know, skid across the water or something. We're going to see because uh, I'm pretty excited for that. I also have a new feature that I'll be rolling out to all future videos, and that is a mailbag request form. So what happens is when I make videos, sometimes the comment sections say, hey, you should get XYZ tool or X device or Y device or whatever um, in order to do what you're doing a lot more efficiently. The problem with that is that it's sometimes difficult to understand what the person was talking about um, or in an instance where there is multiple versions of the object they're talking about. And so um, I have started a Google form um, right now that I'm using just for the live stream, but I will expand it to go on to every new video where that you, the viewer, uh, if you see that my tools are inadequate, if I'm missing accessories, if there's a module you'd like me to, to give a shot to, um, is that you can put in a request on this form uh, stating what it does and why it's useful and who you are. So I have an idea where the idea came from. And although there is zero guarantees that I will ever buy what's on the list, um, it certainly goes into sort of uh, into my thought process. So for the moment, it's actually worked really well because when I'm live streaming and doing some work on stuff, I say, oh crap, I need to order XYZ. Can someone go into the form and fill it out? And then my live viewers, they go and they fill out the form and they tell me, you know, what, what it was that I was missing or whatever. And at the end of the stream, I just grab all those suggestions, put it in my AliExpress cart and order. And so this is going to be sort of like another way for the audience to interact with me and to be a bigger part. The audience will become a bigger part of the whole creative process because this is what I'm here for. I mean, I'm here to, um, to do my own thing, to teach people things, but also to learn. And so if you guys have anything that you need you know, that you'd want me to buy to make my life easier or to do a review or whatever, just put it in the form, uh, treat it as a suggestion. There's no guarantees I'm going to do anything with it or order it or whatever. But if someone does reach out, for example, a, a sponsor, and they want to send me stuff, well, if they have stuff that's on my list, then those are probably going to be the higher priority things. Or if the things on the list are like really cheap, there's an AliExpress sale going on. I want to take advantage. I need to add, you know, four more bucks before I get free shipping. Stuff like that, I can go to that list. So it's very useful. So aside from the live streaming stuff, I do have a couple of YouTube updates in general. If you guys remember in uh, January, earlier this month, I guess two episodes ago, a couple episodes ago, I had an episode with another maker and I said my goal for this year is for my channel to gain importance. And I do believe that it's slowly starting to, you know, capture some of that importance. Um, you guys will be happy to hear that a couple of sponsors have reached out. Um, two of them want to send gear, you know, test gear type things. I won't say what, what it is because obviously these things are always a negotiation back and forth. Yes, I do want to take a look at uh, test gear, especially since I have the live stream keeping me uh, sort of on my toes. And so I'm going to and, and I have a bigger and bigger suite of things to use to test with, which is pretty awesome. Um, so, yes, I do want that. Um, but the important thing is that they are reaching out to me. And in the past, there was kind of like a, a huge sort of drive to, you know, hit influencers. And that has sort of dried up in the last year or two or three even. And so um, this sort of returning to normal is, is kind of good because as a content creator, I only really gain importance by making videos that people want to see. 
And some of the, these videos that people want to see is when they're making purchasing decisions. And those videos are continuously some of my best viewed videos. Um, not immediately, not right off the gate, but certainly over time. So the fact that um, sponsors are reaching out wanting to send me test gear uh, means that this is going to be a new wave of sort of well-watched content, which is what I need to you know, survive in the long run. So this is always great. Also, um, I mean, who doesn't like gear, uh, especially new and novel types of gear? And also, I want to try to push the envelope and make different kinds of videos. So that all goes together. You can't make experimental, cool, and fun videos without having the sort of down-to-earth, searchable content to go with it as well. So that is pretty neat. Uh, second thing I want to highlight is that if you are listening to this in February, mid-February, late February, if you go check out my uh, battery video, my charging a drill battery without a quote-unquote official charger video, um, that video in probably mid-February is going to hit 1 million views. So um, the my best viewed video by 10x for sure uh, that video, as long as nothing goes catastrophically wrong, it should hit 1 million views. And I kind of don't believe it, right? Because this video is the video that I put probably the least amount of effort into. It was a fairly easy video to make. It was something that I needed to do anyways because I wanted to charge that battery. So I figured I'd show you guys how to do it. And it has brought in, you know, nearly... 1 million views. I'm a little cagey about letting you know how much income I made from that video because YouTube is not clear about what you can and cannot share. Some people say you cannot share the income dollar amounts. Some people say you can't um, share the RPM, the revenue per thousand. So we'll just put it at the fact that I have compared with a few of the people who have been on the podcast. Not not all of them, obviously. Not everyone is um, sort of that uh, open about their videos. But I will tell you the RPM is pretty dang low in comparison with other creators' similar amounts of views. Um, but that being said, it's still my highest earning video. I still do not have mid-roll ads on that video. And... Uh, I'm just, I'm not particularly proud of that video. It is what it is. It's bringing in people. Uh, people are watching it. You know, a bunch of people are complaining that, you know, it's too long. Other ones complain that I don't get into enough details. Other ones complain that it's not a legit blah, 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 blah. That's fine. I'm not proud of that that video. I'm happy it's there because of the, the views that, that it generated. But yeah, it's about to hit 1 million views. Uh, at the time of recording, uh, it is the 30th of January, uh, 2024, and 10, 13 p.m. It has 994,022 views, and it is uh, increasing at a rate of about 1,500 views per 48 hours. So soon enough, it will be at 1 million views. Um, however, just talking about my next most viewed videos. The next two I'm actually pretty happy with. So the next most viewed video is 109,000 views and it's my Unity UT210E uh, video review actually. And that was published in 2017. So three years before the battery video. And that's kind of the one that really cemented my channel. So before the battery video, it was my number one viewed video and brought in the most uh, views, which was phenomenal, uh, especially because Unity deserves it. That is a fantastic tool, the UT210E. So definitely, oh, and I'm looking now, I did not put a um, affiliate link in the description. Great, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Moving on to my next most viewed video, 103,000 views is how to get started with a D1 Mini 
ESP8266 in under five minutes. It is a five minute and 11 second video. I swear I'm supposed to have capped it at uh, five minutes, but whatever. You get done in under five minutes. And um, that one is pretty nice because that is, again, that is tutorial content, right? So my second most viewed video is review content, you know, stuff that people could buy. And that makes sense for it to be number two. And number three is kind of like tutorial content. Number four is kind of clickbait. It's the one where my uh, the, uh, my boost converter, my MT3608 DC-DC step-up boost converter caught on fire. Well, that one, uh, 100,000 views. Again, very mixed response on that video. That video just is what it is. Although the hilarious amounts of comments that have no idea what they're talking about is is awesome on that one. But then the next one after that, so we're our number six, uh, 86, almost 87,000 views is another tutorial video. That tutorial video is how to use transistors in your project. Again, very proud of that video. It's 10 minutes long, goes through the basics of uh, how transistors are used, uh, especially as a switch. I'm really proud of that of that video. So uh, that was made in 2020, which is uh, pretty nice. The uh, caught on fire video, the MT3608 DC DC step up converter video, that was in 2016. So that's eight years ago now. At this point, that's a long freaking time. Next one after that is uh, the Elugu Super Starter Kit review, 81,000 views. Again, what people will buy. Uh, and then after that, 76, almost 77,000 views. It is what to buy to get started. Electronics for complete beginners. Again, tutorial type content. After that is how to use capacitive touch, touch switches, then a Kiwitz meter. So this is my bread and butter, you know. But what I do want to say is climbing up the list quickly. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 14th from the top now is my most proud of video, how to use a multimeter, the very basics. That video is climbing slowly but surely through the ranks. It's at 43,000 views and it is gaining all the time. So if I look at the ramp on that, it's, uh, you know, it, it's a 45 degree angle. Uh, it's been live for 600 and some odd days, almost two years. And, um, it's, get, it's garnering more and more views. It's getting about 640 every 48 hours, which is awesome. And this video kind of warms my heart because a agency somewhere in the world, I don't want to name them, they asked me if they could use my video in their training documentation, in their, in their lesson plan. And... I sort of, so I, I am more than happy for them to use it. And the only thing that I'm working out is the details. They want to use it for free, which is fine. This is kind of what I made it for. Um, but they want to rip the video and embed it in their materials, which I'm, I'm not sure if, if I'm a fan of that. I would rather they um, use the embed feature so that they get the views, but they're saying something. Anyways, they want to license it, which is it's quite heartwarming to hear that a real, you know, nuts and bolts sort of training institution uh, found my video and decided that this is the one they wanted to use to teach multimeter use, which is, that was the point. The whole goal was to get people more comfortable with multimeters, people who, who aren't comfortable with multimeters, comfortable enough to use them safely and you know, effectively, especially since multimeters today are so inexpensive, like you get a Kiwitz for 30 some bucks Canadian, or you can even get like an ANEG for like 15 bucks Canadian. And either way, you know, if you follow simple directions, you'll be able to take basic measurements easily. And so I'm really happy that those kinds of videos have an impact on people. And, um, I'm excited. I hope that that multimeter video will become the number one video on my, you know, on my channel at some point. 
because that's the kind of thing that I want to represent me. It's these kinds of videos. And it's these kinds of videos that the viewers on the live stream are also pushing me to do. I've got an email very recently from one of my live stream viewers saying, you know, these are the videos you should be working on. And they're completely right. So, yeah, I wanted to share that little thing with you guys. Um, that my videos, some of them are, you know, doing really well. And some of them are, you know, have higher importance. Um, so, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm kind of speechless on this front. This is something I was aiming to achieve and I am achieving it, especially since I'm trying to take a look here at how many videos I have, but Social Blade is not working very well. I'm doing this, you know, live in front of you guys. Uh, 538 videos I have put out. So pretty cool that I'm starting to have an impact and it's starting to show. All right. Well, it's getting fairly late and I have asked people to leave some Q&A questions for the podcast recording today, although I only did that about 24 hours ago and it's uh, late at night. So I didn't get very many. I got one, in fact, uh, from a YouTube viewer, which is Dilshad. I think he's been watching for quite a while. So he left two comments on my post. One comment is telling uh, me how he struggles with code, which is, that's totally what I do. And he said he likes the open SCAD and to try to, um, to, to uh, telling me to give it a shot. And, you know, I do like the fact that open SCAD is open source. Um, but the, the thing is, it's like command line stuff. It's just, it, it's kind of beyond me. So at some point I'm going to try it. Um, but not at the moment. I really, really wish that uh, FreeCAD worked a little bit more like Fusion 360, like the controls and stuff, because Fusion seems to work with the style of brain, like the, the way that my brain thinks, and so I love Fusion. FreeCAD is just, it's a little bit beyond me, but I do want to like it. So there we go. Maybe I'll try OpenSCAD at some point. But the question he actually asked is if I have a favorite vendor on AliExpress. And I will tell you, um, it's a bit more complicated than that. So I do have vendors that I like to go to and check their stock, but they're not like specific vendors. It's basically when I find items where let's say the item is $2 and the shipping is $1.31 or whatever, when I increase the quantity on the item, you know, so t quantity two, quantity three, quantity four, if the shipping cost doubles or less than that, those are the kinds of sellers that I like. Sometimes it's $1.30, but you, you know, you, you add another item and the shipping is, uh, you know, two sixty dollars total. You add another item, it's three ninety. dollars That's fair enough. To a point, but some of them it'll be a dollar thirty for shipping, and then you go up one and it's a dollar sixty, and you go up one, it's a dollar ninety. That's even better. So those kinds of sellers, I tend to go into their inventory and see if there's anything interesting that they have that I want because the shipping is quite reasonable. In fact, a lot of those sellers, you'll take the stuff and put it all in your cart, and then when you click the checkbox to get all of the items and and pay for all the items. Often you'll see a shipping discount where the, the where they'll discount they'll charge you for the most expensive shipping, and then discount all the other shipping, take it all the way off. Those are the kinds of sellers that I like. So I don't have any specific ones to tell you, but when you're shopping, look out for those because the alternative to those is that you know one item is two dollars plus a dollar thirty shipping, two items is you know two dollars each item plus eight dollars shipping i hate those because sometimes i want to buy two or three of something so i have to do it in multiple orders and so it's like it's the same thing but with a bunch of extra steps so no i don't have any like specific aliexpress sellers but i will tell you when you find something interesting on aliexpress hit the little heart like wish list the item because when you're going to try to find that thing later on using the exact same search words that you used in the first place, you are not going to be able to find them. AliExpress's search algorithm 
has gotten so much worse recently. It feels like they, if you look for something, it's very, very specific. Like you really want this one item, you know, the part number or whatever. You're going to type in exactly what you want in the search. The first like eight results will be related to your search. And then after that, it's all stuff that you've searched for before. All stuff that's been shown to you before. It's like they have a bunch of sellers that they make a lot of money off of, like that their commission is high. And, and so they just keep recommending those sellers instead of the real like niche sellers that you're probably looking for. Like when I go on AliExpress, sometimes I'm looking for just the nichest thing you have ever heard of. Just the other day, a friend of mine was looking for um, an aluminum backed LED strip uh, that goes in his, uh, ho- like his oven range hood. And he had part numbers and stuff. So I was searching by part number. We found some some things that were similar. But my search terms were pretty specific. So it showed me one, two items. And then just a whole bunch of stuff that I've searched for before, like 3D printer parts and, and stuff like that. And then you just change the search query a little bit. You get two or three new items. And then the stuff that I have been finding before. So the two or three new items are like I like are very much related to what I was searching for and they won't show it to me unless you do a new search and a new search and a new search. So when you find something interesting, especially something that is hard to really nail down to really hard to find, um, like for example, if you search for sunglasses, like a very general category and you find the style you like, hit the the wish list on that item because next time you search for sunglasses, you're not going to find it. Or uh, for things that have a lot of repeated listings, like the wow stick, for example, when I bought it, there's like 80 sellers with the wow stick. So you won't be able to refine the seller that you were looking at because it'll churn through some more. Or if you're looking for really specific parts, like I was looking for parts for my uh, 65 horse, 65, my 1969 9.5 horsepower Evinrude outboard. Those parts do exist. They are on AliExpress. They are extremely hard to find because the search terms just brings up a whole bunch of other nonsense, like brackets to mount an electric trolling motor on a Zodiac, like an inflatable boat, for example. So stuff that's only tangentially related to my search gets higher priority, likely because it's a more popular item. And so, yeah, AliExpress has become very difficult in that sense now. So, yeah, when you find a good seller, wishlist their items so you can find them again. And uh, you can also save the seller, but that's a little bit more trouble. And um, be aware that the search can be quite difficult. But if you dig, you can find some real treasures. Well, folks, it's getting really late. I want to thank you guys all for uh, listening to this podcast. Um, I've always said it that the podcast listeners, the Patreon subscribers, and the live stream watchers are the best people ever made. So count yourself if you're listening to this part of that group. And I really appreciate you. It's because of people like you and my Patreon subscribers and my live stream watchers that make this whole thing worthwhile. Thanks for listening, and I'll catch you on the next one.